Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth chapter of the One Book, One Minnesota Statewide Book Club with Pete Houtman, author of Slider. The One Book, One Minnesota program is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book in partnership with the State Library Services and sponsored by Spire Credit Union. I'm Elaine Hopkins, Director of Programs and Services for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, which is the Library of Congress designated Minnesota Center for the Book. As such, we present programming that reaches all corners of our state and promotes reading, libraries, and our state's literary legacy. As we get started this afternoon, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which we broadcast. This land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. I also want to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. Dakota and Ojibwe people are also the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota. And we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. So we created One Book, One Minnesota with a network of library and educational organizations a year ago in April to bring Minnesotans together during a time of adversity and highlight the role of libraries in our communities. Since then, Minnesotans from nearly every county in our state have downloaded books by Minnesota writers more than 52 thousand times. I'll just say that one more time, 52,000 times. So what a testament to the state of readers that we have. In the fourth chapter of this series, library patrons and readers all over the state have been reading and discussing Slider. Our event this afternoon has attendees from across the state and a few other places in the country as well. The ebook of Slider is available for free download for all Minnesotans through Sunday, May 9th, and you can still visit the friends.org slash one book for that link and additional resources. It's also available in the chat. You can purchase hard copies of Slider from Red Balloon Bookshop and other local independent bookstores. If you would like closed captions for this afternoon's event, look for the CC icon on most devices. It's at the bottom of your screen next to the chat and other functions. You can enable either video captions or a real-time transcript, which will populate for you to the right of the video feed. I'd like to thank our other partners, Candlewick Press, the Council of Regional Public Library Systems Administrators, Minitex, a joint program of the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, and the Minnesota Department of Education. This program is made possible in part by the state of Minnesota through a grant to the Minnesota Center for the Book through the Minnesota Department of Education. We want to hear how this program has affected you. So please be on the lookout for a brief questionnaire and we'll also send a link to the recording of today's event. So thank you all again for being a part of the event today. And now I'm honored to introduce our featured guest, Pete Houtman. Pete Houtman is the author of many books for young adults um, and adults, including the National Book Award winning Godless, the science fiction trilogy, Klaatu Discos, which Pete will have to correct me on the pronunciation of, and Eden West. His next book for young adults, Road Tripped, is coming out in just a few weeks. Among his other awards and accolades, he's a four-time Minnesota Book Award winner, and his recent middle grade novel, Otherwood, is the recipient of an Edgar Award. Pete divides his time between Wisconsin and Minnesota, and we are so thrilled that he's here with us today. Welcome, Pete. Thank you for your work, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. It's, uh, it's exciting to actually be able to reach out and talk to people, which I haven't really done for the last year. Uh, <laughs> but uh, hey, it's a new age, right? It is. It is. And I'm so looking forward to this conversation with you, too. Uh, we have some questions that the audience has provided in advance, and we'll also take some questions from the chat. So, I mean, you, you just segued into that perfectly. To start off, how are you doing during this time of pretty intense upheaval and just change for all of us? Well, I I think I'm I think I'm in the early stages of recovery. Um, it's it's been a really it's been a really hard year, 
And um, I was very fortunate. Um, I didn't lose anyone close to me. Um, I didn't get sick myself. And I'm an introvert, so I'm used to being by myself. <laughs> but I really discovered over the past year how my, my limited contact with other human beings, just how important that was. Because it, um, you know, it kind of sent me into a, I guess what I would call a low grade situational, situational depression. Mm. Um, but uh, hey, it's spring. Um, <laughs> I got my vaccine. All right. And, uh, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the balance of, of 2021. So am I, yes. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners today feel exactly that same way. Mm -hmm. So we've asked you here, of course, to talk about Slider. So Slider was released in 2017. And I just want to say this quote because it was so fantastic. Um, this comes from a starred book review um, in Booklist. And it said, more than a story of stomach shattering determination. This is also an unflinching exploration of David's bond with his little brother Mal, who, though their mother forbids the label, has been diagnosed with autism. With crystalline prose, delectable detail, rip roaring humor, and larger than life characters, Houtman gracefully examines what it means to be a friend, a family member, and through it all, a kid trying to do the right thing. So. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. <laughs> there you go. So to start off with that, um, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your inspiration for writing Slider. Several of your readers, including those who are part of the Scott Highland Middle School Book Club, have asked whether you have any real life inspiration for the characters or circumstances in the book. Um, yeah, um, my family. Um, I, I grew up in a a big family, um, seven kids, and I was the oldest. So I knew from a very early age that I was the best. I was the biggest, I was the smartest, I was the strongest. Um, my younger brothers and sisters, um, they didn't have that luxury. Um, they, I think, felt more like they had to prove themselves somehow. And one of the things they did as we got older is that they proved to me that I wasn't the biggest, the strongest, or the smartest. Um, they all developed their own skill set, you know, whether it be social um, or uh, playing the piano or painting or um, you know sports, anything like that. And and I'd been thinking for a long time about. Um, a lot of my fiction has been about, about only children, mm. about small families. And I thought, you know, I've never really written about larger families. I've never written about that, what the experience of being a middle child is. And so I started out first thing by talking to my, my brothers and sisters. And, uh, you know, they had a lot of thoughts about that, that they'd probably been holding in for many years. <laughs> Um, and so I started out uh, to, to write a book about a bigger family. Well, the, in the course of writing, the family got smaller. So now it's a three kid family. There's Bridget, who's the overachieving oldest child in the family. And there's Mal, the youngest sibling who's 10 years old. He's autistic, um, pretty much nonverbal. And then there's David, my hero, who is a regular kid. Um, he's not great at sports. He's not great in school. Um, he's not one of the cool kids. Uh, and he doesn't get as much attention, uh, he believes, from his parents as his siblings do. You know, his younger sibling needs 24-7 care. And his older sibling is, is just this, this brilliant um, college student. And she gets lots of strokes from her parents, which she needs. Um, but David doesn't have a lot to distinguish himself. And I, I started writing about this family uh, before I knew it had anything to do with competition eating. Um, that really came pretty late in the process when I was, I was looking for something because everybody's good at something, right? 
And I wanted David to have a, a skill that was unusual and interesting and maybe not entirely uh, what his parents had imagined for him. <laughs> so uh, David got some eating skills. <laughs> Which, which, he, which he employed to good effect. Oh, that's great. We definitely are gonna get a little bit more into the food aspect as we get along today, but I do have to say that um, I am also a middle child. And while David and I might not have too, too much in common, I felt very connected with him through your portrayal. So I'm a little surprised to hear that you you are the eldest because I would have I would have laid some odds that that you were more in the middle. So you definitely did some great research there. So, yeah, I so my, my my younger siblings definitely schooled me. <laughs> as well as well they should to the eldest. Yes. Well, Probably after that, true. <laughs> after that introduction, would you uh, share a passage from Slider with us? Sure. Um, I want to read a, a, a little piece about, about Mal, David's younger brother. Um, Mal, um, he's 10 years old, as I said, he's nonverbal. And uh, he, takes, he takes a lot of care. He can't really be left alone for any period of time. So this is from chapter six. The chapter's title is Burrito. All the chapters are named after food, by the way. When Mal screams, there's nothing else in the universe but the sound of his voice. It's a black hole of sound, a shrieking vortex of fury and frustration. I drop what I'm doing and run upstairs. Mal is sitting on his bed exactly where I left him. The only difference is that his bag of potato chips is empty and he's screeching. Is he screeching because his chips are gone? or because of some invisible, unknowable thing that only he can see. With Mal, there's no way to know. I do what I always do, <clears throat> which is get behind him and wrap my arms around his chest and squeeze. Sometimes it works. This time, it doesn't. Mal starts squirming and his shrieks get impossibly louder. For a 10-year-old kid, Mal is incredibly strong. It's all I can do to hang on to him. Mom appears in the bedroom doorway with the rug. The instant Mal sees the rug, I feel him relax. The rug is eight feet long and three feet wide. It looks like a carpet in a movie theater, about a dozen colors all mixed and scrambled together in a random looking pattern designed to hide soda pop stains and trampled junior mints. In fact, that's exactly what it is an end scrap of some ugly commercial carpeting. Dad got it from one of his clients and brought it home for use in front of his workbench in the garage. Only he never got to do that because Mal fell in love with it. And what Mal loves to do is roll himself up in the rug. Mom lays the rug out on the floor. I slowly ease my grip on Mal. Okay, Mal, it's burrito time. I let go completely. He slides off the bed and lies down on the end of the rug. And I roll him up all the way, his legs sticking out of one end, his shoulders and head poking out the other. Mal closes his eyes and smiles. Being wrapped in the rug is the best way we've found to calm Mal down when he goes off. He'll stay there happily for a time, a Mal burrito. Then suddenly, it could be five minutes, it could be an hour. He'll start whining and whimpering. And if somebody doesn't unroll him right away, he'll go right back to the screeching. It's all in the timing. Can you stay with him, David? My mom asks. I nod. I can tell from the dreamy smile on Mal's face that he's settled in for at least half an hour. So I sit on his bed and try, as I've tried many times before, to decode his wall. Mal's wall is not just a random mass of feathers and leaves and butterfly wings. Mal has a system. I figured out a few things. For example, all the yellow poplar leaves are stuck on with the stems pointing down, while the oak leaves point either left or right. The blue jay feathers go every which way, but they're always underlined by a black feather from a starling or a grackle. The brown feathers seem to be randomly arranged, but 
I suspect there's a pattern. I just can't see it. Same with the butterfly wings. Although I noticed that the orange and black monarch wings are usually next to an oak leaf. A few weeks ago, just to see what he would do, I went into Mal's room while he was outside, carefully removed two of the leaves and switched their positions. A few minutes later, Mal came back, looked at his wall and froze. I braced myself for an eruption, but he just turned his face toward me without meeting my eyes, smiled his lopsided Mal smile, went directly to the two leaves that I'd moved and put them back where they belonged. Mal doesn't really talk, but he seems to know what we're saying sometimes. The words are all there in his head, tumbling around, rearranging themselves, and mixing with all the other data that comes pouring in through his senses. I think his wall is his way of talking back. If only we could figure it out. I look at him, all wrapped up snug in his rug. He opens his mouth and says, Okay. I said that Mel doesn't talk, but technically that's not true. He has one word and that word is okay. It can mean anything. Yes, no, help, go away, more, shut up, or any number of other things. In this case, I know it means he's ready to be unburritoed. You ready, bro? Okay. I unroll him slowly, talking the whole time, stuff like, Hey, Mal, how you doing, buddy? You have a nice little rug rest? Here you go. Just two more turns and I'll have you out of there. Mom says we should talk to Mal as much as we can. She says, when Mal starts talking, we want him to know lots of words, not just okay. When Mal starts talking, Mom's convinced that it will happen any day now. She says it's not uncommon. She reads everything, and there are lots of cases of kids who never speak a word until age four, five, six, even 10. Not very many wait until they're 10, but mom knows about the ones who do, and she's sure Mal is going to be one of them. Thank you so much, Pete. I'm so glad that you read that section. I, I loved Mal's wall. I really, really loved it. Um, <laughs> And it's a perfect segue because we had a lot of questions from readers and, and I was struck too by the wholeness of your characterization of Mal. Um, and, and so we'd love to hear a little bit more about how you approached writing and creating his character. And if you feel like you wanna share with us too, a lot of people are curious if you, if you do have another real life inspiration. Um. Well, first, I, I don't know any Mal's. Um, I have a lot of autistic friends, but they're in a more verbal area of the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. But I do know that <clears throat> all humans have a lot in common with each other. And Mal, although he's you know very, very different in, in a lot of ways, he's still he still, he loves, he fears, he mourns, he cries, he laughs. Um, he, you know, he, he has a life. And mm -hmm. I just had to kind of try to imagine what that life could be like for him. What, you know, what was it like? What is, you know, why does, too much noise bother him? Why does he react in these kinds of ways? And that's kind of what all fiction writers do. Um, we put ourselves inside of characters that don't really resemble us in any superficial way. Um, you know, I write, I've written several books from the point of view of a woman. I've never been a woman. Um, I write books from the point of view of people that are much, much smarter than I am and people that are much, much less smart than I am. And it's, it's a skill. It's very much like acting. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you look at uh, uh, what an actor has to do on stage or on film or whatever, it's, you know, they have to put themselves inside the head of that character. And it's a learned skill. 
That's why I always recommend to young writers that they get involved in theater because that's great training for, for writing fiction or nonfiction for that matter. Mm -hmm. Was that an, I can't remember what question you asked me. <laughs> I hope that was. No, that, that so, is, <laughs> that is absolutely spot on. We were, we were curious about how Mal came to be. So that was, that was exactly it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, he was, I will say that Mal was, um, was particularly challenging in, in, in some ways. And I had to um, spend a lot of time talking to people and mm -hmm. reading about autism and parents with autistic children. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it took a lot of homework. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure, no, of course, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, so a, a bit of a bit of a segue here into another area, you mentioned that the competitive eating part wasn't there right at the beginning that you found that and you, I am sure will not be surprised that we had a ton of questions around food, <laughs> around why a competitive eating contest, how much can you personally eat? There were, there were many other uh, food related questions, including some from my nephews who are watching in Maryland. So shout out to them. And um, so can you talk to us just like really how, how and why competitive eating? Have you ever been to one, <laughs> a contest? Um, I've, I've only been to them virtually. Mm -hmm. um, other than some, when I was younger, some party contests, like how quick can you eat a hamburger and things like that, uh, which I always won. Um, I like to eat um, and I, I can't eat fast. I can't eat anywhere near at the competitive level though. Um, I mean, these, as a test for myself, I, I bought a package of 10 uh, White Castle sliders to see how fast I could eat them. And uh, I got through eight in about two minutes and I had to stop. I just couldn't face number nine. Um, now, eight of them in two minutes seemed pretty fast to me, but the people that actually win contests for eating sliders, they eat about 13 a minute. Oh my goodness. I know, that's, that's crazy. Oh. But I, I, liked, I liked the idea of, of competitive eating because it is a sport, um, it's a very unusual sport, but it is a sport, it requires skill, it requires training, it requires heart. Um, and the, the people that are at the, at the top of their game in professional eating do a truly extraordinary thing. As you know, 74 hot dogs in 10 minutes or 141 hard boiled eggs in eight minutes. That, by the way, was a record set by a 105-pound woman Wow! named uh, um, the, the, the Black Widow, Sonia. I can't remember her last name. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought, you know, this is something that everybody can relate to because we all understand eating. Sure. I mean, if it was something like golf, we don't all understand golf. I don't understand golf. Um, <laughs> but we all understand eating. We all understand the difference between eating slow and eating fast. And it's also something that a, a kid can do. You know, he doesn't need an arena to do it. He doesn't need a lot of special equipment. All he needs is food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's costs money, but not as much as like a new hockey gear, for example. Right. So I thought it was something that, that everybody could relate to, whether it relate to it in a I'm really grossed out sort of a way or in a I wonder if I could do that sort of way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> wow. Um, a couple of questions. Did you base any of the any of the competitive eaters? The Gurge has come up several times in questions around. Uh, was the Gurge inspired by someone real or just um, a, a little a little bit? Yeah. Um, there have been many instances of cheating in professional eating contests. And uh, it's not like there's one cheater out there like the Gurge, but a lot of little things from different sorts of events, you know, people hiding chicken wings in their pants and stuff like that. <laughs> um, so that was, you know, he was sort of reality-based. 
a little extreme. Um, I don't know of any cases of, uh, of professional eaters using syrup of Ipecac to gain an advantage over their foes, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't put it past some of them. Right. Wow. It, yeah, that does feel like an entirely other world. I mean, I felt I felt very in it as I was reading the book. I was like, this is yes, I, the food, the food as as a common thing for all of us makes perfect sense to me, but I read it with just this complete fascination, never having contemplated competitive eating <laughs> in my life here till now. <laughs> so, so I appreciate that window onto this, this whole other, this whole other world. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's fun for me um, when I'm writing any book, doing, doing the research and learning about professional eating, this whole other world you know, I, I did books earlier where it was about bodybuilding, which is another bizarre, whole different world. Mm -hmm. And um, football, I did one about football. Um, I'm not a particular football fan, but uh, I learned a lot about football while I, was, while I was writing the book. So that keeps me entertained as a writer. And I figure if I'm keeping myself entertained, maybe somebody else is going to be entertained along with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, you've talked a bit about the research and we're curious too about your process otherwise. How do you approach new work? Are you a write every day or write in a particular place on a computer, on paper? We'd, we'd love to hear the sort of behind the scenes. I do, I do on nearly all of my composing on a computer mm -hmm. because I like when I'm writing something to see it pretty close to the way it's going to look on a page. Sure. Um, I get a better sense of the pacing that way. And um, I, I prefer working at home um, where I have access to you know, online information and I'm comfortable and, and there's a dog there that I can cuddle when things are going badly um, or a dog there I can cuddle just because I feel like it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where he is. I thought I thought he might make an appearance here, but he I think he's napping somewhere. Um, I I work on multiple books at a time. Uh -huh. um, takes me usually three to five years to write a book. Um, sometimes as long as ten or twenty years. But I don't work on that same thing constantly. You know, I'll work on a book for a few days or a few weeks, and a lot of times I get stuck. I don't know what's gonna happen next. All of a sudden, I just am I'm paralyzed. I have, okay, writer's block. But instead of sitting and staring at the computer screen and doing nothing every day, I set that book aside and work on a different book. So I'm working on uh, three different books right now. Um, that are quite different from each other. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, going away from a book for a few days or a few weeks relaxes my brain. Mm -hmm. And I can come back and I can look at it with fresh eyes and, and figure out where the book has to go. So you have, you have so many works across many different genres. And um, I'm curious, about what is it about writing for young people, which is, I think has been the bulk of your, your writing for the last several years. What is, what is it about that that compels you so strongly as a writer? Um, well, I started out writing adult books, mm -hmm. um, a series of, of mysteries. And I just, I wanted the freedom to try different things, you know, to try different genres. Mm -hmm. And so when I started writing for, for younger readers, I realized I could, I could write a science fiction book um, followed by a contemporary drama compared, followed by a dystopian story, followed by a vampire novel. You know, I could, I could jump around and do different, different sorts of things. When you're writing adult books, it's a little harder to do that, um, harder to get published doing that. So writing for younger readers gives me a lot of flexibility. And it also um, is rewarding in the sense that, you know, if you think about the books you've read in your life, 
that influence the way that you see the world, the way you think about things, et cetera, et cetera. Odds are most of those books are going to be books you read between the age of 10 and 20. <laughs> um, you know, it's not the thriller that you read four weeks ago that you really enjoyed, but you can't remember the name of the main character anymore. No, it's going to be the spider from Charlotte's Web. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I, I like the idea of, of, of kind of writing for Pete Hoffman as a kid. Um, you know, that's a it's a, a good audience, and also it's a very smart audience, um, and a very literate audience in the sense that they take things literally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you can you can tell some pretty crazy outrageous stories and find a, an audience there that is that is young enough and open enough to really enjoy the story mm -hmm. oh definitely definitely but i'm i think though too not though but i mean i i think that that your your wide range and your breadth really also manages to speak to adults i have to say that i i sat down and read slider <laughs> just like that and enjoyed it I think maybe just as much as my nephews did <laughs> so, well um, you know it's it's for me it's got to it's got to uh, cross age boundaries mm -hmm. um or I lose interest right right one of yeah one of the teachers who wrote in said that that was one of the things she very much appreciates about you as a writer is that your books appeal to so many different students and sort of across so many different areas and um and she was curious if you find yourself gravitating toward one particular kind of story or genre after all of this experimentation or is it really just keeping it changing all the time is 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 your preference? Um, well, I definitely think I'm better at some kinds of stories than others, but I also think that um, it's rewarding to me, and it's I think some of my best work when I try something that scares me. Wow. Uh, like I wrote a, a story called The Big Crunch a few years ago, and that was a love story. It was nothing but a love story. It didn't have any horses or dragons or buried treasure or or pregnancies or anything else it was a very non-eventful love story because I wanted to see if I could do it and uh, I did and it it did very well that was good um, I'm trying now my next book is going to be a horror story because I've never read never written horror before and I don't haven't even read a lot of it um, I mean, I've read Stephen King and some other things, but mm -hmm. uh, it's a genre that I don't know if I can pull it off. So mm -hmm. I'm going to try and see what happens. Great. That's the exciting part. Well, there's some love for the big crunch in the chat. So um, ah. <laughs> um, so I you you had a nice little segue in there. Um, some of some of your readers and some of the audience might be aware that your partner is the novelist and poet Mary Logue. And we had a question in advance of today's event, wondering if you've ever collaborated with Mary on a writing project. Yeah, well, first, Mary's always my first and my best reader. Mm -hmm. um, we read each other's uh, published work 100%, usually several times. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I'm, the book I'm working on now, I'm thinking about asking her to take another look at, even though she's read it three times. I know she's going to groan. I know she's going to roll her eyes, mm -hmm. but she's going to do it, and she's going to give me invaluable advice. We did write a series of mysteries, uh, middle grade mysteries, called the Bloodwater Mysteries, together. Okay. And we... Um, I, I thought the books came out pretty darn good. I thought they came out better than they would have been if I'd written them by myself or if she'd written them by herself. But we passed these things back and forth. I mean, her desk is 10 feet away from mine with a wall in between us. Mm -hmm. And we just would be like emailing chapters back and forth constantly. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty fun. Yeah, they're still available, I think, as ebooks. I don't think the hardcover is still in print. Mm -hmm. But that's a that's an adventure of its own kind, right? That kind of well, it's a test of a relationship in some ways. 
<laughs> but I did, um, I mean, I, Mary and I have been together for over 30 years. And we met uh, at the Loft Literary Center when she was teaching a writing class and I took her class. Mm. So in a sense, we were writers working together before we were, you know, ever involved in any way other than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that origin story. That's great. <laughs> um, so we've had some questions too that have come in around what what do you like to read? Are you as varied in your reading taste as you are in your writing? Um, do you read other books for young readers as well? I do. Um, I mean, for one thing, I have a lot of friends that write books like that. Mm-hmm. So I read all their books. Um, and I've read most of the most of the classics. Um, I reread things sometimes. I went back and reread A Wrinkle in Time a couple of years ago, uh, which was better when I was 10 than it was now for me. Mm. Anyway, um, this past year, <clears throat> I've been doing a lot of rereading, nothing particularly good, but just. Um, you know, old books that I liked for one reason or another, and I just have decided to reread them because I think because of the whole pandemic thing. Mm -hmm. I just didn't have the mental energy to engage a whole new set of characters. Sure. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) I definitely found that I was doing that as well. And there was something very compelling about the nostalgic aspect of that um yeah that's kind of like you know sliding into a nice comfortable old pair of jeans (laughs) and sometimes they don't fit but (laughs) Mm -hmm. right right. sometimes they do and it's great Mm -hmm. so the there have also been a couple of questions sort of we've talked a bit about the different kinds of writing um when you're approaching do you know right away that you're writing something that's going to be more middle grade or like slider is is I think probably right typical middle grade range or or more young adult do you know that at the beginning as you're approaching it or do you discover that depending on what happens with the characters well early on um in my writing career I uh two of my excuse me my young adult books started out as adult books Mm. And they weren't working, and so I made the protagonist younger, and that worked. But now, I know going in, um, I know who the the reader is going to be. I mean, Slider is pretty solidly in that um, 9 to 14 age range, Mm -hmm. depending on the reader. Or over 30 is good, too. (laughs) and there are there's some real important differences between between a, a middle grade book um, like Slider or a young adult book um, like the Klaatu Discos trilogy. Mm-hmm. And that is uh, middle grade and younger books are mostly about to me, I am important. I matter. Mm-hmm. They're about mm-hmm. they're about young people realizing that they do matter. They do have power. This is how they fit into the world. Um, Pippi Longstocking is one of my favorite examples of that. You know, as mm-hmm. she has power. Mm-hmm. Um, young adult books are more about relationships, I guess. Mm-hmm. Relationships with other teens. Um, not this doesn't necessarily mean a love story, but um, you know about how they how they fit in with their peers. Middle grade is more how do I fit in with the world, um, mm-hmm. which is you know sort of a boring intellectual way to put it because <laughs> <laughs> I don't think about them literally in that way when I'm writing them. I've, right, right. But that is but that is definitely so apparent with with David's story. I mean, we're right there with him as he's experiencing everything in his family and he just does these things or thinks of these things um 
But as we read it and are on this journey with him, it really is sort of discovering how he matters and, and sort of, or those answers coming to him. I mean, I just, the again, the, the familial relationships and, and how complex those are. And when you're thinking about, you know, sort of like nine-year-olds reading this, I mean, we can analyze it as adults, but they're in it and they're realizing it's complex too, you know, as, as they're living it. Um, yeah. I don't yeah. know if that makes sense, but. Well, I like it. And, and the, the experience of a nine-year-old reading slider is very different from the experience of a 13-year-old reading slider. Mm -hmm. But um, it works, I hope it works for both, both of those ages in different sorts of ways. Yeah. You know, some people have asked me if I'm going to write a sequel to Slider. Oh, really? And I'm not. <laughs> but if I did, it would be a young adult novel. Okay. Because now, you know, by the end of the story, what's important is um, the relationship between Sin and Heyman mm -hmm. and the relationship between David and, um, and his, um, his new girlfriend, who he's not sure if she's a girlfriend or not. Right, right. That is, I, I mean, I... <coughs> I wouldn't have seen necessarily like a sequel because um, it does, Slider does feel so complete. Are there any other books or characters that you didn't necessarily think that you were going to write a sequel to and then came back and discovered that you did have another novel in it or one that's maybe out there? Um, yeah, uh, I wrote a book called Invisible, which is about a... Um, a damaged young man who is having trouble and all kinds of horrible things happen to us. Really terrible things happen in that book. It's also very funny, um, which is the only way I could get myself to the end of the book was to put a lot of funny scenes in it. Mm -hmm. And people kept asking me and asking me if, if uh, I was going to write a sequel to it because they wanted to know what happened to this character after the end of the book. Mm -hmm. And about five years ago, I thought I saw a way to do that. I started writing. I sold the book to Simon and Schuster. I wrote 150 pages of the book, which would have been about a 200 page book. And I reread it and I just hated it. Oh no. I just hated it. I didn't like where the story had to go. I didn't like the tone of it. I, you know, everything was wrong with it. So I, I called my editor and I said, you know that book you paid me for that was due like three months ago? Uh -oh. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I wrote a completely different book to replace it mm -hmm. that, that was much better, hmm. much more fun to write. Right. I, I suppose that, that that does make sense as much as we, as readers, might want to know what happens next with someone or to have a continuation of a story that we really appreciated or, or the viewpoint of a character with whom we were really connected. Um, but that sometimes it just, it just isn't meant to be. No, no, I, I'm here to say, no, no, no. You do not want to read that book. <laughs> All right. It's a bad book. <laughs> well, I would love to have one more section of, of Slider, if you're willing to share another, another sure. bit story. <clears throat> um, this is a section, it's very short, it happens much later in the book. Um, David's sister's boyfriend, Derek, has, uh, he's heard that David can eat a lot of food really fast. And he decides he's going to bring David in as a ringer at the annual um, slider eating contest at his fraternity. Um, so he talks David into it, and they're driving to Simpson University. During the drive to the college, Derek expounds upon his philosophy of life. Everybody's good at something, he says. Take me, for example. I'm good at recognizing opportunities and capitalizing on them. Such as, I'm already bored. Such as today, if I hadn't taken the opportunity to give you the opportunity to enter this contest, you'd never have had the opportunity to win it. Uh, that's a lot of opportunities. It's what I'm good at, he says. 
You're good at eating. Did you know that you're basically a tube? I'm a what? A tube. Teeth on one end, butthole on the other. All those other things, arms, legs, brain, heart, those are just extras. Topologically speaking, you're a meat donut, a hole surrounded by flesh. If you take into account the nostrils, you're a three-hole donut, but basically you're a tube. Oh, great, now I feel really special. It's important to recognize one's own nature. Derek reaches into the back seat and grabs a snack-sized bag of Fritos. He tears it open. The car instantly fills with the smell of corn chips. He shoves a handful into his mouth and starts chewing and talking at the same time. Did you know that Fritos were invented in the 1930s, he says. I didn't know that, but I want some. I make a move toward the bag, but Derek holds it away from me. Uh-uh, the only thing you're eating today is sliders. So what do you do when you're not eating? I do a lot, I want to say, but instead I say, nothing. You don't have a girlfriend? I'm 14, I say. I haven't had the opportunity. Sometimes you have to create your own opportunity. Yeah, well, there's not a lot of choice in Vacaville. I mean, there are only like 20 girls in my whole class. What about your friend, the Chinese girl? You mean Sin? She's not. She's cute. She got a boyfriend? No, and she's not. Opportunity, Derek says. Sin's just a friend, I say, and she's not Chinese. She's Korean-American. Whatever, he shrugs. Same thing. It's a good thing Sin isn't there because she might have taken the opportunity to punch him in the throat. Oh, goodness. Thank you. Oh, Derek. Derek drove me crazy. Derek drove me <laughs> crazy. Um, that, thank you so much. I was on mute because I was laughing a lot during during your reading of that. And, and some people shared the fact that they were laughing out loud as well in the chat. So thank you. Um, one question did just pop up in the chat. And um, it's a question about Iowa. So you divide your time mostly between Minnesota and Wisconsin. And um, anyway, what is it about Iowa? There were some props to you for the really good local color. Um, do you have some roots or ties there as well? Well, it's a Southern state. And uh, I, have, I have friends in Iowa um, that we visit fairly often. And there's something about, um, it being kind of right in the middle. You know, it's a big, fairly flat state, a lot of corn, and uh, it's not a state that most people know very much about. Um, and I, I just thought it would be fun to, to set, a, uh, set a story down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did have the opportunity to do research down there because as I said, I was, I was visiting down there. I had a friend who was a professor at Simpson College, which is where um, the slider eating contest takes place. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, I set an, another book down there too, didn't I? Yeah, yes. yeah. But yeah. one of the book I'm working on is set in Iowa. Okay. Yeah, my horror novel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, and you have a book that's coming out in just uh, in just a, a couple of weeks. Well, that's that's out. Um, oh, is the it, oh, it is yeah, out. yeah, okay. the paperback is coming out. Road tripped. Okay. Which was uh, um, uh, that was a fun book because it, it gave me the opportunity to <laughs> uh, drive the Great River Road all the way down to Mississippi because um, that's what my character does. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always wanted to write a road trip novel. So that's what, what road trip is, is my road trip novel, a whole other genre. Right, right. Well, I hope that you have many more opportunities for actual on the ground research in this you know, coming year and two, um, as, as maybe life gets a little bit back to, 
ba more back to what we, you know, have been accustomed to. Back to some sort of a new normal. A new normal is is a good yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so, so very much, Pete. This has been such a pleasure to talk to you today and to be able pleasure to revisit well. Slider. So um, just thank you very much. Um, I'm just very grateful to all of our listeners as well and all of the readers in the state. Every time we end a program like this, I'm just, um, I have, I leave with an even greater appreciation of the book and the thoughtful readers that we have in our state. So thank you all very much. Um, again, if you haven't had an opportunity to read Slider yet, and this program has piqued your interest, do not despair, you have more time. The download of Slider is available through May 9 on eBooks Minnesota. So you can check that out again. The link is in the chat or you can find more information on the friends.org slash one book. So on behalf of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library as the Minnesota Center for the Book and State Library Services, Thank you to our wonderful audience today, to Pete Houtman, and to our program partners, especially Spire Credit Union. You know, if you're interested in finding out about more books that we, uh, more book events that we have coming up, you can sign up for our e-news by visiting www.thefriends.org and um, keep up to date on all of those activities. So thank you again to everyone. Thank you, Pete. And um, thank you. we're looking forward to the pleasure. next one book, one Minnesota. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.